So now we begin with the chapter of radiotherapy. So radiotherapy is a branch uh, which is also called as radiation oncology wherein we are going to use radiation now for the therapy of the patient that is for the treatment of cancers. So we know how radiation acts or radiation damages that is why a double stranded DNA breaks as well as free radicals right. So those are the two mechanisms by which radiation acts. One is mutations in the form of double stranded DNA breaks. The second is free radical damage. So both of these mechanisms, what if we use them in a targeted manner to kill tumor cells? That branch is called as radiation therapy, radiotherapy or radiation oncology, right? So how does radiotherapy act? So like we have discussed, first mechanism is going to be via mutations and the most common type of mutation is going to be through double stranded DNA bricks. The second mechanism is via free radical injury. So via both of these mechanisms, we are going to have radiation which is going to kill the tumor cells. The type of radiotherapy will depend upon the distance of the source of radiation from the tumor. So if we have the source of radiation at a distance from the patient, that is called as teletherapy. Just like how we have telemedicine, teleradiology done from a distance. Similarly, we have teletherapy where suppose this is the source of radiation, the patient is going to be lying somewhere around here. Now, the disadvantage with teletherapy is, let's say this is the tumor here in the abdomen of this patient. When the patient receives the radiotherapy, the entire track of that tumor bed is going to be irradiated, right? So, anything anterior to the organ, anything posterior to the organ, everything is going to get radiation and they are also going to suffer from these side effects. That can be prevented by the next form of uh, radiotherapy which is called brachytherapy. So, as the name suggests, brachy means short. So, now the distance between the source and the tumor is going to be short. This is done via three modes. The first mode is called interstitial brachytherapy. So, the prototype for this is carcinoma prostate. So, let's say this is a prostate which has the malignancy within it. We are going to put these radioactive pellets within the parenchyma of the prostate. So, this is interstitial brachytherapy where the organ itself is impregnated with these radioactive pellets and so that all of the radiation is concentrated there and the surrounding organs are spared. So, remember interstitial, the example you need to remember, CA prostate. The other route can be via a cavity. So, the next route is an endocavitary brachytherapy. The prototype would be a CA cervix wherein the radioactive agent would be inserted through endocavitary route via the transvaginal route and the cervical cancer would be irradiated. The third form is called as mold brachytherapy. Herein, we are going to create these molds which can form a mold around superficial structures. Let's take an example of an eyelid cancer. So, we can create a mold that will be stuck on the eyelid and which will cause radiotherapy, uh, which will cause irradiation. There. So, we have this mold brachytherapy for uh, the various examples would include eyelid CA, lip CA, right, penile CA. So, wherever superficial malignancies are involved, we would have the uh, uh, source of radiation being created like a mold over it, okay. So, these are the options for brachytherapy, interstitial, endocavitary, mold and we have teletherapy. The third source that we can use for radiotherapy is the systemic form. Herein, I am going to inject the radioisotope into the systemic circulation. This can be via an oral or an IV route. And now it is that radioisotope which is going to find the malignancy and go there. Let's take an example of iodine-131. So, iodine-131 is going to go wherever there is thyroid, right? Thyroid has an affinity for iodine. So, iodine-131 is the radioactive agent that will be pulled wherever there is thyroid or wherever there is thyroid malignancy, right? So, this is a systemic route. So, we just put the iodine-131 in systemic uh, circulation and it will go and find the tumor rather than us finding the tumor, right? So, this is the systemic form of radiotherapy. What are the agents that we can use? So, one, we can use gamma rays. These used to be the most commonly used agents previously. However, they are now superseded by x-rays. 
the reason behind that is gamma rays were actually produced by these radioactive elements the most common ones used to be cobalt 60 cesium 137 which will produce gamma rays right so we were going to produce all of these elements in nuclear reactors and because of their radioactive property these are going to release gamma rays which are used for radiotherapy the problem is that these have long half lives we'll be documenting them but cobalt has a half life of 5 years cesium has a half life of 30 years right so we need to store these radioactive agents for so long right and they are constantly going to be emitting it's not like a machine where you can turn it off so once activated these are going to be radioactive for a very long time so they had these storage issues because of which gamma rays are not used very frequently now but we prefer x rays x rays as you know are something which is produced by the x ray tube by the machine so this is something that you can turn on and turn off and you can also produce a variety of energy depending on what kind of a penetration we want we can modulate the energy of these x rays and these are the reasons which make it desirable and that is why it's the most commonly used agent for radiotherapy nowadays apart from that we also have electrons that can be used both of these are produced via a machine called a LINAC which stands for linear accelerator yeah and the latest uh, agent that we use are protons right so protons are something which are recent advanced they are produced in the machine called a cyclotron all right so these are the various agents that we have gamma rays x-rays electrons and protons now let's study the behavior of each one of these so this is a curve that we call as the dose depth curve what kind of a dose are these agents going to have as they penetrate through the body as they penetrate through the distance so x-rays and gamma rays behave in a very predictable manner wherein as they go deeper in the tissue they keep losing their energy so throughout the track they are basically going to be dissipating in energy so this is the predictable behavior of x-rays as well as gamma rays correct now the electrons and protons have a uh, typical behavior so the electrons are low in energy they are only going to have their maximum dose in the superficial structures and then it dies down all right so remember the electrons are going to have their maximum impact superficially where can we use this so as is logical we can use them for cutaneous malignancies right so electrons are the agent of choice for cutaneous t-cell lymphoma so cutaneous t-cell lymphoma which can also be called as mycoisis fungoides is something where electrons are the agent of choice apart from that if i ask you that we have uh, a patient who is already in the or and we have the patient which is open but the tumor somehow becomes unrejectable let's say an example of pancreatic ca you have opened the patient up for a surgery but you find that it's invading the nerve plexus, it's invading the vessels and it becomes unrejectable. Can we offer something to the patient? Yes. So this is where electrons come. When the patient is already exposed, intraoperatively we want to give radiotherapy. When the tumor bed is superficial, can I give these electrons which have the maximum impact most superficially? Yeah. So the other utility is going to be intraoperative radiotherapy this is very frequently used in ca pancreas where you can combine it with surgery yeah so intraop radiotherapy is again something where electrons are desirable because they have the maximum impact superficially protons have a very uh, typical behavior so how are the protons going to behave so protons do not have a lot of dissipation superficially very deep in the tissue they will have their impact they'll have their peak and this peak is referred to as the Bragg's peak. So who shows the Bragg's peak is a repeat neat question. It is going to be the protons. So the protons are going to be showing you this Bragg's peak. And one more very important pointer about this is this makes it very desirable for tumors which are situated deep in the tissues, which are situated in complex sites. So an example which is asked in the exam is clival chordoma. So clivus as you know is situated deep, you have the brain stem in the vicinity. So you want to basically have a targeted sort of a concentration of radiation here and you want to save the surrounding organs from this radiation. So for that protons become very desirable. So 
remember these two facts about protons both of these are independent repeat questions so this is the behavior of various agents talking something about interstitial brachytherapy right so we had seen in brachytherapy that we are going to be putting these radioactive isotopes within the prostate so if they are radioactive don't you think while inserting them the operator the surgeon will also get exposed yeah and do we want that no we obviously don't want that so for that what we do is a technique called remote afterloading wherein for example say this is the uh, interstitial brachytherapy procedure which is going on what we are going to do is we are going to take this grid and we are going to put in these empty pellets yeah we are going to put in these empty pellets first and then through a robotic arm we will place the radioactive isotopes in this grid and the empty pellets so what are we doing we are doing an afterloading right we are not putting the radioactive isotopes we are putting these empty pellets and then the radio isotope is inserted via a robotic arm so this is also a repeat question where is remote afterloading done so remember it is practiced in brachy therapy right so this is about remote afterloading now talking about gamma knife so gamma knife which is also referred to as stereo tactic radio surgery so as the name suggests this is a combination of radiotherapy and neurosurgery which is done for complex brain tumors so what we want to do for the brain is we have to save the surrounding brain from damage right whenever we give a targeted source of radiotherapy we do not want it to damage the surrounding brain tissue so what we do is we have this frame or this helmet that the patient wears which is called as the lexel frame or the lexel helmet based on the name of the person who discovered this technique who was lars lexel yeah so we have this lexel frame which basically provides us with the coordinates of the tumor in three dimension so this frame is going to tell us that these are the coordinates of the tumor and what we are going to do is we are going to give a targeted dose of radiation to that precise point which will save the rest of the organs so this is much like a surgical strike where you do not want collateral damage but you want to kill that terrorist similarly we are doing this we are killing the brain tumor without any injury to the surrounding organs so this technique which is a very desirable technique is called gamma knife or stereo tactic radio surgery so this is about that one thing it needs lexel frame as the name suggests we are going to be using gamma rays here right and this is only being used in the brain in contrast we have something called as a cyber knife again a recent advance cyber knife remember there is going to be no frame or helmet this can be used anywhere in the body not just the brain and we are going to be using line act we are going to be using x rays instead of the gamma rays here right so this is gamma rays versus cyber knife what are all the applications of gamma knife so we can use this for vascular tumors which will bleed a lot so the surgeons don't want to go in so we can use it for vascular tumors like glomus jugular cavernous hemangiomas avm we can use it for complex anatomical sites like what all so we can use it for complex anatomical sites like cp angle schwannoma pituitary or we can use it for certain niche indications like solitary metastasis or trigeminal neuralgia which is refractory to treatment so first line for this is going to be carbamazepine if the drug is not responsive it's refractory trigeminal neuralgia gamma knife can be attempted right so this is about gamma knife 